Okay, I think this is a good time as, as any. So welcome everyone to the next installment in the workshop on entrepreneurial finance and innovation seminar series, the second to last of the spring term. Stay tuned for call for papers for the fall. Um, I'll introduce the speaker in a second, just a reminder on the format. Uh, we have 40 minutes, to 15, <laughs> uh, and then a Q&A, correct me if I'm wrong on that. Uh, we've got two, well, all the co-authors here. Uh, so everyone in the audience who have questions, start with chat. The co-authors will be monitoring that. And if there's a deep question that the co-authors decide or just need to be answered verbally, then they will interrupt Jawan and uh, answer it out loud. Uh, yeah, with that, I think we are ready to go. Juan, if you want to start sharing your screen, we are uh, happy to have Juan Farremensa here presenting work on patent acquisitions and inventor productivity. The floor is yours. Awesome. Uh, can you all see my screen? Looks good. Perfect. So thanks, uh, Mike, uh, Song, Yale, and David uh, for organizing the web seminars. It's, it's been a treat, you know, that started during the pandemic and it's great that it keeps on, keeps on giving. And um, uh, this is co-authored with uh, Zach uh, from the University of Houston and Jordan from the University of Washington. And they, are, as, as Michael said, uh, they are both here, so they will be kind of handling the, the chat. Um, so what we kind of, this paper is motivated by the following observation. Um, startup acquisitions are commonplace. There's a lot of ways to kind of uh, make this point, but you know, just one that was handy to me was that uh, in our paper with Michael, we we find that approximately one third of uh, VC backed startups that don't fail, they are acquired within seven years after raising the first round of venture capital. However, the welfare implications of these acquisitions are unclear. And the literature has kind of made arguments and presented evidence that point both to a positive side of these startup acquisitions and also to a negative side. So on the positive side, uh, uh, it's been argued that uh, uh, by acquiring a startup, essentially large firms are able to more efficiently outsource their innovation. And also these acquisitions, these active market for acquisitions in a sense provide uh, incentives to inventors because they, it gives them an exit opportunity that they can rely on, particularly you know, in recent times where IPOs have, have been relatively uh, less, less common. On the other side of, of the equation, uh, you have a couple of uh, recent papers that have kind of crystallized these concerns that you know, are certainly not new that uh, some of these uh, startup acquisitions, they might just, they could just be killer acquisitions as Song's uh, paper kind of uh, very cleverly, you know, labels. And, uh, you know, in, the idea is that these acquisitions are motivated just by competitors, uh, incumbent firms, trying to just acquire a potential competitor that is coming up in, in the industry. And, uh, and this allows these, uh, these incumbent firms to essentially, you know, kill off these competitors before they get too big and pose a threat to their incumbent uh, position in, in the industry. So we, you know, there's, there's evidence on, on both sides of, of, uh, of this debate. And what we try to do in, in this paper is we try to see, well, let's focus on one particular aspect of uh, startup acquisitions. And in particular, we are gonna, the way how we are gonna be measuring these acquisitions is gonna be focused on acquisitions of a startup's initial patent. And what we want to look at is how the acquisition of these startups of, of their initial patents affect the productivity of the startup inventors going forward. Uh, now, of course, you know, the, the challenge that we face here as much of the literature that I've been discussing is that these acquisitions are not random. And there's good reasons to believe that they are correlated with some unobservable traits that could also impact the future productivity of the inventors of these startups. So you can think about, you know, two sources of bias, at least, that uh, might push actually in opposite directions. One is, of course, uh, higher quality inventors are more likely to have their patents acquired because, you know, all else equal, they produce better, better uh, patents, and these are more attractive to incumbent firms. And so if we don't control for this, then we're going to just see that, you know, uh, the kind of OLS uh, effect or uh, the OLS estimate of this acquisition will just be all because we're capturing this, you know, selection bias in who gets acquired. We could also make kind of uh, another argument, which is to say, well, you know, these transactions, whenever the, you know, there is a buyer, there also needs to be a willing seller. And perhaps, you know, if you are a, an inventor that you're already kind of sick of it, uh, you want to retire, you want to give up inventing, let's say, then maybe you're also more likely to just go and sell your patent. And in that case, you know, you will see a negative bias on just kind of the plain vanilla OLS results. 
So uh, what kind of what do we find if we just you know for a moment let's leave aside any endogeneity concerns? Let's just run a novel less regression where we are just simply repassing uh, you know the future productivity of the uh, inventors of the startup on whether the 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 first pattern of the startup is is acquired. And what you find here is that well, lo and behold, it looks like these acquisitions are great. Uh, for the productivity of the inventors. Uh, they you know, produce more patents going forward. Uh, if you wanna look at the extensive margin, they are more likely to produce at least one patent going forward. And at the intensive margin, just focusing on those that go on to, to actually patent, then you see also this you know, strong, uh, significant intensive margin effect. So you know, here we are trying to, uh, we have a bunch of fixed effects for the technology class, the art unit of this, uh, of these uh, patterns all interacted with the air. So we're trying to control for a lot of the, you know, things that we know about these patterns and still you see this very kind of a strong positive oil as a uh, estimate. So, you know, if you just kind of, if I stop here, uh, we will conclude that, you know, these, uh, these acquisitions are great for productivity and, you know, we should just maybe encourage them to, you know, happen more, more, more often. One thing that we're able to do is we're able to, given that we're able to track these inventors before and after they, kind of join the startup, uh, we're able to kind of control for their prior productivity. And an interesting thing that, that you can see if you just, again, within this OLS setting, you control for the prior productivity, the prior number of patterns that that inventor had, had been able to, to produce before joining the startup, you see how that really decreases quite substantially this OLS estimate. So this, you know, at least to us, it suggests that maybe, you know, this bias that I was uh, talking about, this kind of selection bias is really operating here. Uh, controlling for uh, the past productivity helps alleviate it a little bit, but of course, you know, there's a lot of observable differences in the quality of inventors that this is, you know, just very noisily proxying for. And, uh, and it is possible that, you know, uh, some of these unobservable differences are still driving this positive all as estimate. So, um, by the way, if instead of just looking at the number of uh, patterns that these inventors produce, you look at the kind of uh, some measures of the quality of these patents, for, in, for instance, the number of patents that they produce that are in the top 10% or the top 5% in their kind of uh, technology class, you're still finding this you know, strong positive impact of uh, positions. So it looks like uh, these uh, positions are productivity boosters, not just in terms of quantity, but also in terms of the quality of, of innovation. Now, of course, uh, you know, as, as I was saying earlier, uh, the concern here is that these acquisitions are endogenous. And uh, to be sure, we are not the first in the literature who you know, think that there's a problem if you just regress uh, positions on something because positions are endogenous. And the very popular approach to address these, these acquisitions has been a mid uh paper uh, published in 2014, but I think you know, it was his job market paper uh, early on. And, uh, and essentially the idea of this, of this IV approach uh, of addressing these endogeneities just compare completed acquisitions, so essentially what happens to firms that actually you know, are acquired, to firms where there is an acquisition announcement, but for exogenous reasons, those acquisitions end up not being completed. And this is, you know, if you, if you truly uh, you know, can make the case that this uh, failure of these acquisitions is exogenous, then this in a sense gives you a very clean counterfactual for how those firms that you know, were still targeted for an acquisitions end up doing you know, when they are not acquired. And that's, you know, that allows you to at least, you know, uh, 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 kind of address this kind of selection concern that we've been talking about. Uh, now, the problem, of course, is that this uh, identification strategy is actually not, not really applicable if you want to look at uh, startup acquisitions for at least two reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, this requires you, this uh, strategy requires you to essentially have pre-closing public announcement of acquisitions. Uh, and that usually doesn't happen, you know, if, if a startup with 20 employees is being acquired, you're not going to see a lot of publicity about, around the announcement, let alone before the acquisition closes. Uh, most of these acquisitions of startups are not, material, are not material, so, you know, even if the acquirer is a public company, they don't need to disclose it. And so this means that you're just not going to have a lot of these kind of failed acquisitions uh, if you're focusing on acquisition of startups, just because, again, they are not. Not announced. Uh, at the same time, also, if you look at Saru's paper, most of the kind of uh, exogenous reasons that, that he identifies to identify this kind of exogenous acquisition failures are instances in which regulators uh, object to the acquisitions on competition grounds. 
And of course, uh, most startup acquisitions, they are just not going to take a regulatory review because these uh, are too small to kind of, you know, be on the radar of uh, competition authorities when measured, you know, on the kind of stuff that they care about, like HHIs or this kind of IO measures. So because of these two reasons, uh, you know, you cannot really apply a serious identification strategy to startup acquisitions. And that's why, you know, this identification strategy was originally designed and has been mostly applied to acquisitions involving public firms as standards. So uh, what's, you know, what's our solution to this, uh, you know, to this, to this challenge? So this is kind of uh, the main contribution of, of this paper. This is, you know, this is an identification paper. Uh, let me be upfront about this, and I'm going to spend, you know, a fair amount of time working through our identification strategy. And uh, but it just in in a nutshell, what what our identification strategy does is it's essentially motivated by the following three facts. And I, you know, as I said, now I'm just going to throw them at you, and then I'm just going to walk, you know, step by step to try to convince you about, you know, about about this. So first of all. Uh, Around 20% of all patent citations are added by examiners. Uh, so essentially, when you see a citation in a patent, it's not the inventor that decided to cite that you know, previous patent, but it is actually the examiner during the review process of that patent application that says, hey, you cannot say this, or you, know, you need to be careful about this because there is this other patent that has already uh, you know, at least claimed part of what you're saying. And, uh, and then this, uh, as I'll show you, these citations, you know, enter into the pattern, and they are marked with an asterisk that allows us to, to, to see that this was a, a, a citation that was actually added by the examiner. Second, uh, the examiners are more likely to cite patterns than they reviewed in the past. I'll show you this. You can think about, you know, guess some sort of recency bias, or examiners are more aware of patterns that they themselves review. I guess makes makes sense. And third, uh, and I'll talk more about this, but in many, not necessarily all, but in many other units, the assignment of patent applications to examiners is quasi random. Uh, if you know you follow some patent papers, you'll you'll know that this assumption three this is a common assumption in you know uh, several recent papers that try to leverage different aspects of the examiner's tendencies to to get to identification in in, in patent settings. So now, uh, what's kind of what we're going to do with these three facts? is to argue that they combine to produce essentially quasi-random linkages between startups and potential acquirers via shared examiner. And again, due to this random assignment, these uh, linkages are essentially as good as random within our units. And so we are gonna then exploit these quasi-random linkages as, a, as, a, as an IV, uh, arguing that they increase the likelihood that a startup's patent is acquired by an incumbent firm. So essentially, if you are linked to many incumbent firms in your industry via these shared acquirers, you are more likely to have your uh, patent acquired. And that's essentially our first stage. And that will allow us to then kind of uh, address the endogeneity of patent acquisition. So what do we find when, when, to do this, when we do this? Well, essentially, the OLS results, they, they, they get completely reversed. Uh, we find actually a negative effect on the productivity of patent inventors from these uh, patent acquisitions are leading to between 4.4 and 6.7 fewer patents uh, over the following five years. Five years is always going to be our kind of uh, measuring timeline. Interestingly, this is actually an intensive margin effect. Uh, we don't find uh, any extensive margin effect. It's, it's kind of a, a reasonably uh, well-estimated zero. So there really seems to be no extensive uh, margin effect there. And uh, interestingly, you might wonder, well, is it because you know, these inventors, now they have more resources and perhaps they are able to focus on fewer but higher quality patents? That doesn't seem to be the case. If, if, if anything, the results are a little bit noisy, but if anything, uh, the opposite seems, seems to be the case. Um, so I've seen, I've seen some, some questions in the chat. I don't know if uh, I need to, to pause or I just keep going. Okay, so I'll keep going. So let me just, uh, you know, so the roadmap, uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the data, then I'm going to, uh, you know, present these three key facts and try to kind of present evidence for them. Uh, then I'll talk about the identification strategy, main results and output. So data, the main thing to, to keep in mind about data here, so it's all, you know, standard uh, pattern data from, from the USPTO different sources. Perhaps the data set that might be less well known to those of you, you know, who have worked with pattern data is this pattern assignment data set, which essentially captures pattern transfers. And uh, this was put together by Mark Cohen co authors in 2015, and it's one of these data sets like patents views, uh, PATEX, that the USPTO makes available to, to researchers. Now, one thing to keep in mind here, 
is that the recording of these patent transfers is voluntary. Uh, however, uh, there are strong incentives, you know, both from patent statutes and from federal uh, uh, laws that kind of incentivize, incentivize these, uh, the, the recording of these, of these transfers. And so, you know, which is what is necessary uh, for these transfers to be uh, picked up in this data set. So again, it's, it's a voluntary thing. Um, and, you know, to the extent that some transfers uh, might not be captured, there's nothing we can say about them. Uh, but there's at least, you know, there's there's good good reason to believe that most uh, acquirers, you know, are, are gonna are gonna want to to uh, to record their transfer with the USPTO, which then means that it's gonna show up in this data set. Uh, so we're gonna look from uh, 2001 to 2021 utility patents. A couple a couple more kind of definitions or key variables that I think are are important to keep in mind. So I'm gonna be talking. You know, I've already done it, and I'll keep talking about startups throughout the presentation. What I mean by startup here is going to be a first-time patenting firm. So it is a it, this is a firm that is uh, applying uh, for its for its first first patent. Uh, by the way, uh, the USPTO very helpfully has this disambiguation mechanism that allows us to follow uh, assignees, so essentially patenting firms over time, and also inventors. So we just kind of trust them for for this. So this is our going to be our definition of a startup, and then when it comes to patent reassignments, we're going to be looking, you know, within five years or or patent grant, and uh, this is somewhat technical, but essentially, you know, a lot of the assignments that you see in this data set, they are essentially assignments from the inventor to the firm that the employer of the inventor. So of course, we are not going to want to capture this. We're going to uh, want to capture just you know uh, assignments of patents, you know, from one firm to the other. And uh, there's a way to measure this in this data set, and that's kind of what, what we follow. So the way to think about these reassignments is essentially uh, the pattern is going from one firm to a different firm, not from an inventor to, to, to his or her employer. So summary statistics, uh, around 23.3% of the patterns of these startups in our sample are acquired within, uh, within five years, so change hands within five years. As I mentioned earlier, we're able to follow the patenting history of the inventors over time with this disambiguation algorithm that the USPTO has. And uh, we see that uh, in terms of future patents, the mean inventor in our sample, these startup inventors will produce 2.85 uh, future patents, uh, 5.48 is the standard deviation. And in terms of prior patents, so most of these inventors, they have been working uh, somewhere else, not a, a startup, and they had uh, already been uh, had patents to their name. At the mean is 3.2, and the standard deviation in this case is 7.5. Okay, so let me now walk you through these kind of three key facts that are that that underpin our identification strategy, and then I'll show you how the key facts in sense build up to to an ID. Uh, as I said, this you know it's it's a, it's an identification uh, heavy paper, uh, but kind of this is the legwork that we need to to make to be able to address this this endogeneity. So. Our goal is to develop a novel identification strategy that will identify the effects of startup pattern acquisitions. And uh, I'm just going to try to convince you of these three key facts. So the first one is that examiner added citations you know, exist, and, and they are uh, important in terms of quantity. Uh, here is an example of a pattern for a portable urinal, urinal, urinal system. I have a two-year-old daughter, so you know, a potty training is very much in my mind. Uh, but uh, the, the key thing to keep in mind here is that um, here are the citations. They always show up on the first page of the pattern, and then if needed, uh, they continue later on. And you can see this uh, asterisk, you know, next to some of these citations, which says cited by examiner. Uh, so this is essentially, you know, these are what we call these uh, examiner examiner added citations. How prevalent are, are they? So this is a histogram of the uh, citations, uh, the percentage of the citations that are uh, added by the examiners within each art unit year. In our sample, recall art units. Uh, for those who haven't worked with USPTO data, art units are these groups of examiners within the USPTO that they are all uh, looking at applications within the same technological field. It's kind of their the way how the USPTO is organized. When an application arrives, it's assigned to an art unit according to its technology, and then uh, the, it goes to one of the examiners in that in that art unit. So you can see how uh, you know uh, approximately the model is around twenty. Day. 20% of the, of, the, uh, of the citations that we see in the patents in our sample have been added by the examiner, so they had that asterisk. If you actually look at patents that are granted within the previous five years, so citations to patents that are granted within five years, so that will be 
you know, citations to patterns that are, uh, you know, relatively at the cutting edge of uh, technology. You actually see that here the share of examiner added citations actually increases, and it's, you know, you can see that it's the, the median is around 50%. Uh, okay. So hopefully, you know, this convinces you that a examiner added citations, you know, are important. They make up a substantial share of all citations, particularly among size to recently granted patterns. Uh, and to be sure, you know, other people have, you know, are aware of this. We're not the first people to claim that these examiner added citations exist. Uh, so the, the the second step that, that I need to show you, or hopefully convince you of, is that uh, examiners are more likely to cite patterns that they themselves have reviewed in, in the past. So in order to do this, so again, we're going to now zero in, we're going to be focusing on these examiner added citations, and the idea is that um, when an examiner adds a citation to a pattern, uh, if the examiner has reviewed that same pattern in the past, then that increases the likelihood that that uh, pattern is going to be added by him or her uh, as, a, as a pattern that needs to be cited. So how are we going to kind of personalize this so that we can test it in, in the data? So what we're going to do is for any pattern that is granted in a given our unit and year, so let's call them current patterns, uh, we are going to be look at all the pairwise combinations between this current pattern and all the patterns that were granted in the same art unit over the last five years. So that's what we're going to be calling prior patterns. So we're going to have this huge number of pairs between a current pattern and a prior pattern. And essentially, we're just going to run a regression where the dependent variable is an indicator that will be equal to one if a pattern I, the current pattern, is citing this past pattern. And then the key independent variable is going to be an indicator that will be equal to one if the two patterns the uh, in the pair, the current and the prior pattern in the pair, uh, they share the same examiner. So, you know, if, if it is true that there is this kind of uh, tendency of examiners to cite their own patterns more than other patterns, then we are going to see uh, that kind of this independent variable is going to have a positive estimate. And then we're going to have a huge battery of uh, fixed effects that, you know, try as much as we can, given the information that we have, to control for the kind of technology for the year, Etc. Of, of, of these two patterns in, in the pair. Uh, by the way, this gives us uh, such a huge number of pairs, uh, given you know, how, how many patterns there are out there, that uh, we're just going to report results for a 1% random sample. And you know, you'll see how this already gives us you know, over 142 million observations. So what you see is this you know, expected, uh, expected impact of having the same examiner is indeed positive on the likelihood that the current pattern in the pair cites this prior pattern. How, you know, what's the magnitude of this? So this is essentially is an increase of between four and five basis points uh, that is driven by sharing the same examiner and the unconditional probability in our sample of a pattern citing another in, in that same unit is around 0 0.9 basis points. So it is a substantial, a substantial increase. Now, um, so, you know, hopefully I've convinced you of, of kind of this, this second this, this, this second step, uh, which is that examiners are more likely, you know, cite patterns that they have in their minds. The third thing that we need to discuss and that will be key to the identification you know, in this paper, as it was in, in other prior papers, is the assignment of pattern applications to examiners needs to be random so that essentially, you know, everything that, that we do in this paper, uh, you know, really has claim to, 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 to be strongly identified. Why is, this, why is this important? Well, a concern that you might have, and you know, let me be clear, there are good reasons to have this concern, is that even within our unit, so even to be, uh, within these you know, small groups of examiners in the USPTO that they are all supposed to you know, share the same kind of technological field, you might still have essentially specialization by certain examiners within certain subfields uh, in, these, in these art units. Now, if this is the case, then this, this will be a problem for us, right? Because essentially then what, what we'll mean is that our IV could correlate just with essentially the acquirer and, and the target being more uh, technologically close. And that's why, you know, they have the same examiner because that examiner is specialized in that subfield. And then that could correlate with acquisition outcomes as uh, uh, chance uh, paper, for instance, uh, argues. So um, you kind of, you know, you need to buy this quasi-random assignment uh, so that you know everything that I'm telling you about, in a sense, is 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 well identified. Now, uh, there's you know good anecdotal evidence that, for instance, in many art units, uh, it is the 
once you randomly assign application number that is used to, um, to, to kind of determine which examiner gets which application. So essentially, you know, uh, the application number is just assigned, uh, not quasi random, uh, sorry, it's assigned just sequentially. And then, you know, a uh, certain examiner gets, you know, all the applications that finish in one, the next examiners in two, three, four, five, and, you know, that, that, that should really uh, be a quasi random assignment uh, approach. And uh, to be sure, I'll, you know, a bunch of recent papers, you know, mine included, but also, you know, from other, you know, well-published papers have, uh, have essentially used this quasi-random assignment uh, in order to, you know, uh, underpin their identification strategies. For instance, you know, in, in our paper and some Patrick Williams papers, we were looking at the leniency of examiners as an IP, which again required this quasi-random uh, assignment uh, for, for this IP to be, to be valid. However, uh, you know, that's not the end of the story. There's a, a recent paper by Riggi and Simco where essentially they, you know, they try to investigate whether there is evidence of, at least in some R units, uh, there being, you know, specialization by, by examiners. And they do find some evidence that at least in certain R units, uh, we do have, you know, evidence that certain uh, examiners are specialized in certain subfields within that, that R unit, which if we don't do anything about that, that would be a problem for us. Uh, so, of course, you know, that we're, we're going we're gonna to do something about this. And uh, essentially what we're going to do is uh, we're going to define uh, what we call the random examiner assignment subsample, which I'm going to, you know, for everything that we do in the paper, we're going to have the results for this full sample and for this subsample, uh, which includes two types of, of our units. So the first ones, and here we are very fortunate to have uh, this paper in the AHA applied by Feng and Caravel, uh, that they essentially were confronting the same problem. And what they did is to say, okay, let's come up with a test that allows us to identify those are units where we actually find evidence that applications are assigned to examiners based on the application number. And so, uh, you know, this is of course not the only random assignment mechanism that you can think of, but it's one that, you know, we have anecdotal evidence that is, is used quite prominently. And, uh, and they come up with this test that allows them to identify uh, these R units, and we're just borrowing their test. So that gives us a bunch of R unit years where, you know, we, we, we feel confident that assignment is random because it takes, uh, because it's based on the last digit of the application number. Second, uh, Riggi and Simco themselves, they argue that in uh, the computers and communication areas, uh, when they look at this, they find very little evidence of within our unit examiner specialization. And so we are also going to use all their units in these, in these two areas as part of our uh, random examiner sample. Because of course, uh, you know, the, the Feng and Caravel test only identifies one potential approach, this uh, assignment based on the last digit of the application number that our units can follow to, 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 to be random in a sense. And so that, that's why we use this, this, this two groups. So with these, we end up essentially losing a little bit more than half of the uh, observations in our sample. Uh, but that still makes us feel much more comfortable in this subsample that really this quasi-random assignment is going to hold, which is key for our identification. So for instance, this is the result I just uh, showed, you, showed you earlier, uh, showing this uh, self-citing tendency of examiners. And you can see how it also falls in this uh, random examiner subsample. Okay, so hopefully I've convinced you of these three key facts. Uh, examiner dissertations are important. Uh, uh, examiners are more likely to cite their own patterns, the patterns that they themselves have revealed. And then uh, we've discussed the quasi-random assignment. So now what I'm going to be doing is use these three key facts to, in a sense, uh, build the identification strategy that will al allow us to, um, to identify the effect of uh, patent acquisitions on the productivity of, uh, of uh, startup inventors. And I'm going to be doing this in, in three steps. So first, I'm going to show you that incumbent firms are more likely to buy a startup's first patent if the incumbent examiner adds a site to that patent in the process of reviewing one of the patents of the incumbent. So, um, so essentially, you know, if you are Google and you are asked to cite, you know, a small uh, uh, a patent by a, by a small startup, then uh, we are going to see in the data uh, that you are more likely to go on to acquire that patent. Now, this is helpful to us, but of course, this could just reflect that um, there's a reason why the inventor asked you to cite that patent, which is that, you know, that patent is technologically close to what Google is trying to do. And so that's why Google decides to go and acquire that startup. So we need to go, in a sense, a step further. And uh, in the second step, what we're going to show is that incumbent firms are more likely to buy a startup's first patent 
if the incumbent and the startup share the same examiner. So now we're just, we're not looking at whether, you know, the examiner asked the incumbent to cite the, the startup. We're just going to be looking at whether they are sharing the same examiner. And, uh, and, and we're going to show you that this leads to an increase in the likelihood that the incumbent buys the startup's first bank. And this is, you know, great for us because of course, you know, uh, given our assumption of quasi random assignment of applications to examiners, this is a source of exogenous variation because, in a sense, whether a, a, an incumbent and a startup share the same examiner is all but random within the same, the same market. It's still not quite what we need because if you think about this, this is essentially, uh, as you'll see, this regression is at the startup specific incumbent pair. And what we want to have is something that, in a sense, moves the likelihood that the startup is acquired by any incumbent. So we just, we're just going to aggregate this step two by essentially constructing our, our finally our ID, which is just going to count the number of links that a startup has with incumbents in its industry. And so essentially the idea is that if you are a small firm and if you are linked to you know, a bunch of large firms in your industry, uh, Google, Yahoo, et cetera, then that, you know, our ID is going to predict that you're going to be more likely to be acquired than if you are a small firm and you know, for random reasons. You have less of these of these linkages, so that that will be our our idea. Okay, so I kind of I promise you these these three steps. I just need to fill in the blanks now. Uh, so the first one is uh, we're just gonna look that indeed when you are uh, asked by the examiner to cite a startup, then the incumbent uh, is more likely to buy that uh, that startup's first pattern. And we do this within this sample where we essentially have all the pairwise combinations between uh, startups first pattern. And all the firms that had been granted, granted a patent in that same R unit within the prior five, five years. And you can see, you know, this is a, a strong positive uh, estimate and it is robust within the random examiner assignments of sample. I'm not gonna be showing you all, you know, every time because oh, it's too many tables, but they, they are in the, in, the, in the table. So we can put a check on, on the first step. Now for the second step, we kind of need to move away from actually looking at citations and just look at linkages uh, between startups and incumbents uh, to see whether they sharing the same examiner increases the likelihood that the incumbent buys the startup's uh, first pattern. And indeed, this is, this is the case. And this is a fact is, as you might have expected, it's a stronger for incumbents with an acquisition history. And this, we're gonna leverage this when we actually build our, our ID. And again, a ton of uh, fixed effects here to you know, try to control for, for everything that, that we have. Finally, uh, we are gonna aggregate this up. So, so far we've shown this you know, in a pairwise, uh, pairwise uh, manner. So uh, we are finally ready to define our, our ID, which is gonna be the number of link incumbents, which is essentially the number of incumbent firms with which the startup pattern I, that was granted in at unit J in my P, is linked via shared examiner. Uh, so we need to have this linkage between the pattern, the first pattern of the startup and the incumbents via shared examiner. And specifically what we require to kind of operationalize this definition of, of, a, of an incumbent is it needs to be somebody, a firm, that has at least one pattern grant uh, in that R unit in the prior five years, that has acquired at least uh, 10 patents over the prior five years. So that kind of leverages this uh, Finding that our uh, 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 you know these, these linkages are stronger when we have a, an incumbent that has an acquisition history, and then essentially the timing needs to the timing leads needs to line up. So the incumbent must have been granted a patent in our unit J that was reviewed by the same examiner as patent I, and whose application date was 12 months or more after patent I, and uh, less than uh, four years before the grant date of patent I. Essentially, what we're going to make sure is that the examiner, by the time the examiner is reviewing the pattern of the incumbent, he or she is aware of the pattern of the startup because she has already reviewed it. And, uh, and we still leave some time for the, for the information to flow, let's say from the examiner to the incumbent and the acquisition for us to be measured within our five year uh, time frame. Okay, so this is, this is our ID, little bit technical, but hopefully it makes, makes good sense. Uh, by the way, this is kind of, you're just gonna see the histogram of this variable of the number of linked incumbents uh, within the same uh, R unit. So in some cases, you know, you are not linked to anybody. In some cases, you could be linked to up to you know, 30, 40 uh, incumbents. So uh, this is, you can think of this as a, our first stage. And what you see here is that indeed, 
when you are linked to more incumbent firms, you are, the, the startup's first pattern is, uh, is more likely to be acquired by, by an incumbent firm. And that, you know, that is true regardless of you know, what kind of fixed effects we, we include or whether we lock or not these, uh, these linkages. So just to give you a sense uh, of the magnitude, uh, what this tells us is that one standard deviation increase in the number of linked, in, linked incumbents increases the probability of a pattern being acquired by uh, 1.98 percentage points. And remember that the unconditional probability was 23.3%, so it is, a, it is a substantial increase. Okay, so I'm done with my three steps. Uh, let me now, uh, you know, finally <laughs> show you some, some results. Uh, so, you know, just to put it all together, we are trying to look at the effect of uh, startup pattern acquisitions on the productivity of inventors. Uh, the, the challenge is that these acquisitions are not random, so we are going to explore these quasi-random linkages between startups and incumbents via shared pattern examiners, as I did in a two-stage list per setting. So I've hopefully convinced you that this uh, IV works in the sense that it's, it's relevant at the first stage it works. Uh, and the exclusion restriction, essentially what you need to, to believe is that the number of linked incumbents um, between a startup and you know, common firms in an industry via shared examiners can only affect a startup inventor's future productivity via the impact that it has on the likelihood that the startup patterns are acquired. Um, so you know, hopefully uh, you think that this, this assumption makes sense, at least within the random examiner assignments at some point. Joan, you have uh, about four and a half minutes. Awesome, thank you. Um, so, um, so yeah, I think I'm, I'm good on time. So first of all, um, this is kind of, this is the same regression that I showed you very early on in OLS, but now properly estimated, if you will, uh, with, uh, with, with our IV. And uh, what I'm plotting here, sorry, what I'm showing here is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is made up of estimated within a sample where we have all individuals that are listed as an inventor in one of a startup's first five patents, as long as the patent trend date is within a year of the startup's first patent. So we are looking at all the inventors that participated in uh, one of the startup's first five patents. And what we see is that indeed, when uh, the, the, the patent that that inventor participated in uh, is acquired, we see that the, like, that the number of future patents that the inventor produces goes down by 4.4 or 6.7 when you also control for the prior uh, number of patents that the inventor that the inventor had. So uh, you know, at the kind of you know, if you just look at this, you include every value in the sample, you find this negative impact of these acquisitions of the patent acquisitions on the productivity of these inventors. We don't find any effect at the extensive margin. You can see that's essentially zero. And all of the effect is concentrated at the intensive margin. And essentially, this here we can, because we are only looking at those that have actually a future pattern, we can uh, take the log of the number of patterns. And you can see this is a reduction of between 58 and 70% in the productivity of these inventors stemming from this hopefully well identified causal impact of this, of this acquisition. Um, so that's uh, the results. If we do IV points on, the results are also, are also robust. If uh, we look now at the examiner, uh, at the random examiner assignment sample, which I already told you how we define, which is kind of key for us to feel confident that really there is no specialization of examiners within these R units, we see that if anything, the magnitude of the estimates increases, the extensive margin is still zero, and you know, this is almost as, as much as zero as one can, can get in, you know, in real data, uh, but uh, the intensive margin is, if anything, is stronger, it, it, it happens, even though we lose approximately 52% of, of our sample. If you want to look at the quality of these, of these uh, future inventions, you might be worried that perhaps now that uh, this, uh, this inventor has more money, maybe because he or she sold the pattern or because now he's still working for the acquirer, uh, he can focus or she can focus on you know, higher impact, higher quality patterns. Uh, and there's a bit of a trade-off of, you know, between the quantity and the quality of future patterns there really doesn't seem to be evidence of that. What we find is that if, for instance, we look at the number of top 10% uh, cited patterns, top 5%, we still see a, neg a negative impact. If we look at uh, measures of uh, per pattern quality, we also see a negative estimate. Uh, this is a little bit uh, more noisily estimated number of citations per pattern or whether the average future pattern is of above average quality. But still, you know, there's really no, no evidence of uh, inventors focusing on hiding patterns. Um, 
within the, uh, the random examiner assignments at some point, again, the exact same message. So let me conclude. Uh, what we uh, show is that startup pattern acquisitions reduce the future productivity of startup inventors, both in terms of quantity and quality. It's an intensive margin effect. Uh, there's zero effect at the intensive margin. It is, hopefully at least that should be clear, it's key to address the endogeneity of these acquisitions. The owner's results actually you know, paint exactly the opposite picture. Uh, acquisitions are great according to OLS. And uh, in order to address this endogeneity, we, uh, we use this novel IP that essentially looks at quasi random leakages between startups and incumbents via shared pattern examiners as a source of identification. Uh, let me just say one thing that, you know, it's really on our to-do list and we are, you know, uh, thinking uh, about this and hopefully Jan might also, you know, give us uh, maybe some, you know, some, some thoughts on this is we, you know, we think that we need to do more in terms of trying to identify the, the mechanisms at play here. You can think of at least, you know, two stories maybe pattern acquisitions just provide an exit opportunity for these inventors, and then they just kind of choose to retire uh, after you know, the kind of causal effect of the acquisition is that now they have money and they can enjoy their quiet life and they don't need to worry anymore about you know, inventing stuff. Uh, or of course, it could be a killer acquisitions or a kill zones that you know, have, has been uh, discussed in prior work. And you know, we think that if we could get closer to identifying this mechanism that will round up the paper, uh, hopefully quite nicely. Uh, Thank you very much. I look forward to John's discussion. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, our discussant is, oh, just uh, stop sharing yes. real quick. There we are. <laughs> uh, our discussant is Jan Benner from UBC. Hi, everyone. Hey, Jan. Let me Thanks. share my screen. Can you see it well? Yeah, looks good. Perfect. Uh, oh, thank you, Mike, uh, for inviting me to discuss this uh, interesting paper. It's always good to see a work from <clears throat> people who are experienced in the in the field. So it's kind of a well-crafted work. Um, <clears throat> uh, the big question here is what is the impact of acquisition on startup companies? And then uh, the authors motivate the work through kind of a trade-off that is indeed very relevant and complex and not entirely understood which is what uh, that on one side, M&A market encourages innovations by small firms because it's providing exit opportunities for founders, angels, and uh, key private equity investors uh, like VCs uh, and their active in this space. But on the other side, there are other, there's more recent work that shows that uh, not all the acquisitions uh, uh, may be Kind of a, on a good side, there might be killer acquisitions in pharma, possibly elsewhere, or in the kind of a space of digital platforms, there might be some acquisitions might create some barriers to innovation due to basically monopoly power. So this trade-off, I think, is first order importance. It is something that I've been thinking about quite a bit myself. It's a very ambitious topic. Because if you think about trying to say something about welfare implications in this context uh, uh, that is related to startup, uh, startup acquisitions, it's, um, um, yeah, it's, a, it's a tall order. Um, <clears throat> so this paper focuses on the technology links between firms and how they drive acquisitions. And just like, let's uh, review the thought process here. Um, uh, the, the, the premise is uh, the fact that uh, many citations uh, to prior patents uh, are added by examiners. So that sort of creates links between firms. And these links are created by examiners. In some cases, uh, in the kind of how the USPTO works is that these assignments of patent applications to examiners to examine them uh, is random. And then <clears throat> the authors convincingly find that the examiners are more likely to add citations to patents that they recently reviewed. Okay, so that's, uh, it is this sort of frequency of adding citations to prior patents is, uh, is higher relative to technological similar patents reviewed by other exam examiners. So it's kind of nice work, it's a, it's a, it's a good finding. And then this process uh, creates quasi-random links between firms uh, in this technology space. Uh, that's, that's nice. Uh, and then some prior work shows that uh, links 
between firms in technology space, for example, like the links uh, that are uh, measured by citation flows, is associated, associated, associated with acquisition incidents. So that's relevant for acquisitions then. And then <clears throat> the paper basically analyzes the consequence of these randomly created links for pattern acquisitions, incidents, and the outcomes. I think it's a very rich setting. It's very careful data work, and it's interesting initial analysis that I was very, very happy to read about. <clears throat> so I reviewed this um, uh, pro uh, reasoning uh, that sort of were like uh, the uh, key uh, key building blocks of the paper because I think it's uh, <clears throat> very important, and it's very important also to understand exactly what is the process that leads to these uh, uh, random citations to be created by examiners. Uh, so I, I I try to thought about think about it, and I think about it as a, a process that is some sort of a frictions in pattern examination. Process. So examiners will be busy. There is a plenty of evidence that are busy. And then therefore they are uh, unlikely to have an equal knowledge of the entire prior art, as well as the patent applicants do not have an entire knowledge of, uh, of, the, uh, of the prior art, no? more perfect knowledge of the entire prior art. So therefore plausibly an examiner's examination process in the past is ex ex something that is the key driver of uh, the examiner's knowledge of the prior art. And therefore it is not surprising that examiners more likely at citations through patterns that they reviewed because they are silent, salient, this is something that they know about. So I find this result very, very plausible. And as I said, so I kind of understand this through this factual examination process that the examiners are essentially too busy to do the, to, to, to do the work. Um, <clears throat> okay, but uh, to me, under this understanding of the process, such, such citations that are created by the examiners are still citations to relevant prior art with respect to the patent that they prosecute. And therefore, they, these links that they create still reflect links between firms in the technology space. So they will basically create, uh, create links or citations to relevant prior work <clears throat> that they know about and that this, the prior work that maybe the applicant didn't know about. Okay, so this is just my take on the process. Might be different, but I think it would be good to to to, uh, to if the authors in the paper have uh, their own take on the process because I think it's uh, it's important what is going on later. So it's <clears throat> so because I think it affects the interpretation of the results. So my view is that even if these uh, citations uh, <clears throat> lead to a random, they are randomly created, it's no question about it. These citations are likely trigger and acquisitions maybe for the same economic reasons as citations that are created by applicant themselves. So it is correct that these citations are quasum randomly created and generate exogenous variation in the likelihood that the startup is being acquired by an incumbent firm, but this doesn't mean that the acquisitions are uh, occurring for random reasons. So this selection process based on the relevant prior art or relatedness might be ongoing or going in a similar way along the lines of the citations that were created by uh, applicants or along the lines of the citations that were created by the examiners, because these are all links in the technology space that reveal the relatedness of patents in this technology space. Okay, and this is important because uh, this spot there is the exogeneity, uh, and then I'm not disputing it at all. It's uh, kind of uh, important to think about what sort of randomness and what sort of endogeneity this uh, empirical framework is helping to solve. So prior work has mainly focused on this endogeneity in the acquisition process due to the selection. Therefore, the literature look at these announced but non-consummated deals, <clears throat> but maybe uh, through the kind of a uh, random assignment of uh, citations, maybe we cannot fully rule out all the selection because there will be some selection based on this quasi-randomly created lanes because they are just links to the relevant prior art. Okay, so, <clears throat> uh, uh, and then, uh, so, so certainly uh, the analysis is capturing the effect of what I think 
is the differences between information sets of examiners and applicants, because that might be the key, because these links plausibly were not in the information sets of the applicants when they applied for a patent, but they are in the information set of the examiner, and therefore examiner added these citations to, uh, to, to the application in the process of examining the patent. So therefore, there might be some sort of possibly information shocks when the applicant learns about the examiner's sites, and there might be very meaningful shocks because the, now the applicant learns about uh, the prior work that the applicant didn't know about while working on the patent. So in, in fact, the paper's conclusion, in the paper's conclusions, they have to say that the current draft of this paper leaves some questions uh, along the lines of what the mechanism is driving our findings and answer. So I agree with that it's very promising work, but maybe focusing on these differences in the information sets and these information so shocks and then understanding what exactly is the differences in the selection between the known links versus unknown links into acquisitions might be exactly the piece that might link to lead to the understanding of the econ economic mechanisms that might explain the findings. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I have some, so it's my kind of a, a more conceptual point. I also have a, a few comments on the results. So obviously the oldest result that patent acquisition leads to startup investors innovate more and then uh, both on the extensive and intensive margin and the results are opposite for IV mostly for the extensive for the intensive margin piece. So <clears throat> when I was reviewing the uh, regression specifications, so what mostly drives the probability of having the same examiner uh, <clears throat> between an, a, a potential acquirer or an incumbent firm and the startups, and therefore the presence of quasi random citations. Okay, so first of the effect will be the size of the incumbent patents portfolio and whether the incumbent is active in the same technology field, right? So for example, obviously when you, when you compute the similarity between any firm with respect to any, any other firm, in this in the technology space, you will find that most firms are similar to the big tech companies like Amazon, Apple, Google, and all these, because they are just active in every field, and therefore every firm will be inevitably similar to those firms. So I think that has to be uh, controlled for the very, very in, uh, uh, precisely. So I think the correct specification is the one with the incumbent by art unit by year fixed effects, which, for example, is column 10 of table four, but I would like to see all the results to be done with that sort of specification, because I think it's uh, uh, is important. And I also think that the IV strategy should account for this income and size effect, which might be time very, I mean, size effect in, 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 the in, the, in the technology space, because I think it's a key driver of the similarities in technology studies. Okay, uh, uh, going to con Conclusion a little bit. So I also uh, uh, I'm aware of this this welfare point that you raised at the beginning of the paper, right? So how does the main result speak to the welfare? Okay, so uh, the you, you the key result is the acquisition of startup inventors. Um, <clears throat> startup inventors first patent leads to fewer patents. Okay, so. <clears throat> is a key for a welfare or, or under what assumptions is a key statement about welfare. So it might be that after the acquisition of the focal patent, for example, it might be that other inventors that work for the acquirer will produce more patents due to the fact that the patent was of the first focal inventor was acquired compared to what that inventor would have produced. So therefore there are no lost sort of patents if you view that more patents is welfare improving, of course, there are like arguments that maybe welfare is not exactly kind of related to the number of patents uh, only. There are people who say that uh, welfare and number of patents is basically unrelated, or even, even the reverse. Or anyway, so, or, or, or along the same lines, you can think about commercialization. It might be that the patent acquisition makes the focal patent more likely to be commercialized and that it's better from the welfare perspective to have a one patent commercialized rather than many patents not commercialized. So therefore this fact that the, the inventor might not be 
working on follow-up patents might not exactly mean that's uh, bad for the welfare. So if you decide to motivate the paper through this sort of uh, uh, welfare perspective, uh, which I very much like, so you really need to be aware of sort of this big picture question that are <laughs> hard to hard to pin down or at least acknowledge the, the discussion and uh, the work that has been on, on, on this. Anyway, I think it's a great topic. Uh, as I said, I've been thinking about this trade-off uh, quite a bit in the past myself. It's certainly interesting result. The key question is why? Why we see what we, what we, what we see? What is the economics behind that result? And then uh, uh, based on that, what we can say about welfare and also a little bit like, what do we mean? Maybe the best way would be to narrow it down to talk about welfare of inventors or startups or requirers, also so maybe society at a lot. So I don't know, <laughs> maybe it would be um, uh, advisable to take a more sort of narrow uh, perspective uh, rather than um, welfare in, in general. <clears throat> and uh, also, I think it showed up in the in the discussion a little bit. The result is really about patent acquisition. Are the result generalizable about acquisitions of startups? That's also related to the to the welfare. What do you mean? Do you mean uh, exactly the welfare of investors versus startups versus uh, founders of these startups uh, versus uh, in, uh, investors of these uh, of these firms? I think it's promising work. I'm so glad I had the opportunity to read it, and I encourage authors to continue working on it.